Today we're going to dig a little deeper into our series test and touch on some of the, the bigger bears, so to speak. The most important one on our list today is I want to really highlight the ratio test. In order to have a chance at a 5 on this exam, we've got to master this test because we use it when they want to find the interval of convergence. Now, this particular topic... I'm going to save interval of convergence for a separate video here later in the week, um, but I just want to kind of set the tone here and just because of that question right there being so prevalent, this particular test is really, really, really important. Okay, so here's the ratio test, and I think we're pretty good on the lingo here. Um, the bottom line is, is we're going to take the limit as n approaches infinity, and what we're going to do is we're going to take the n plus first term and we're going to divide it by the nth term. Now, instead of dividing it by the nth term, let's say we're going to multiply by the reciprocal of the nth term, because that's usually what happens. And we're basically saying whatever you get for your answer, that limit has to be smaller than 1. And as long as it's smaller than 1, then we're going to say it converges. And in fact, we could actually say it converges absolutely, which is another topic we'll get into at the end of today's video. Um, obviously, if the limit's greater than 1, it diverges, and if it's equal to 1, then things get really interesting. And we say that it's inconclusive, and, um, and that's the big reason why we have to check the endpoints when we do do an interval of convergence, is because you know when it's actually equal to 1, we're not sure it could go either way. Uh, a couple of the things to look for. How do I know when to use the ratio test? What are some tips? When do I use it? Here's my advice. If you see factorials, or if you see exponential functions, you know, like 2 to the n, then I would jump on the ratio test right away. And technically, you could use it on any series, but obviously, it's more convenient on some than others. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example and just make sure that we're crystal clear on how to attack this particular test. Um, what if I gave you the series n factorial over quantity 2n plus 1 factorial? Now, I know we're already pretty darn good at the ratio test, and I chose this one for a uh, particular reason. I want to see if we can accurately build the n plus first term. Um, of course, because of those factorials, I started thinking ratio test right off the bat. And so my n plus first term, my numerator n plus 1, quantity factorial. Now, check out that denominator. What do you want to put there? Now, we're substituting an n plus 1 in for that n right there. And as I make that substitution, I have to distribute the 2 first and then combine like terms. So I actually ended up with 2n plus 3 quantity factorial. Now we're going to multiply by the reciprocal of the original nth term. Okay, And we're hoping for a result less than 1. Um, and I just need to start cleaning things up. Now for instance, let's see, what could we kill here? I could say this bear kills that bear and I just get the quantity n plus 1. Now, if I expanded, think about expanding this one on the bottom out. It'd be 2n plus 3 times 2n plus 2 times 2n plus 1, etc., etc. So I'll put the factorial there. We could cancel the factorials. And as we begin to clean this one up, let's see, I've got an n plus 1 on top. Now, you don't actually have to do the foiling on the bottom. What you can say is, the biggest term, if I did FOIL them, the biggest term would be what? 4n squared. And I'm not really worried about the rest of it. I mean, you could go ahead and finish it off, but that's really a waste of time. Um, now, as I do my power fight, I have small over large, so the limit evaluates to 0. And because that's less than 1, we have a convergent series. So the moral of the story here is I want you to be able to build that n plus first term. I want to make sure we get the 2n plus 3 right there. I think we, we're quite strong with the comparison test. The biggest thing I want to watch out for is watch, watch for false answers or, or inconclusives, I should call them. There's a lot of times, if, if, if you prove that the bigger one diverges, we can't say anything conclusive about the smaller series, okay? Or vice versa. If you prove that the smaller one converges, we know nothing about the bigger one, all right? So here's the deal. We'll say that uh, B's the bigger one here. A is the smaller one. Put a little S there. So all we're saying here in this first one is that if the bigger one converges, we know for sure that kind of acts like a ceiling and it encloses the smaller one and he has to converge as well. I think it's just a lot of common sense. If the smaller one diverges, then of course the bigger one's also going to have to diverge. So let's take a look at a good example here. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Let's try. 2 over 1 plus e to the n. Now as I, you know, comparing, you know, picking the proper series to compare it to is kind of like an art. 
And what I try to do is I try to only delete one term at a time if I can. So what I do is I say the red one on the left has a bigger denominator. Therefore, as a fraction, he's smaller. I could look at the green one and say, well, let's see, the 2 can really go here. And what I have is I have a geometric series. The common ratio is 1 over E, and that's certainly smaller than 1, so therefore he converges. And if the bigger one converges, boom, the smaller one also has to converge. Now, with regards to the alternating series, this is a very friendly series for us. I just want you to be aware of the prerequisites. Okay, first of all, A sub N by itself has to be positive terms, all right? And then the negative 1 will cause the alternating component. The terms have to be decreasing, and they, their limit, as n approaches infinity, has to equal 0. And if those three things are true, then we have a convergent series. Now, there's two little tricks that are going to make it alternating, either negative 1 to the n minus 1 or negative 1 to the n. Or, in fact, really negative 1 to the n plus 1 would also do it. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at, I get a couple of quick ones here. Let's take negative 1 to the n. Uh, let's take n plus 2 factorial. And then we'll do all over e to the n. All right, so here's what we're going to do. When I say a sub n, I'm really referring to this part right here. That's your a sub n. We basically disregard the negative 1 component. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask ourselves, what's the limit? as n approaches infinity for a sub n. And what we got cooking here is you'll see the nth term test kind of reveal itself. We've got large over small. And so that equals infinity. And because it's not, we'll say infinity is obviously not equal to 0, therefore this alternating series instantly diverges right off the bat. Um, let's see here. Uh, another example that's worth looking at Let's consider this series. Let's say negative 3 to the nth all over n plus 1 factorial. What I'd like you to do here is just kind of separate the numerator and say negative 1 to the n times 3 to the nth all over n plus 1 factorial. All right, now you can recognize it is an alternating series. When I say a sub n, I'm referring to this piece right here. And we'll say the limit as n approaches infinity of 3 to the n over n plus 1 factorial. I'll tell you, a couple of fast-growing functions here, but we do have small over large by comparison. And because that equals 0, we have a convergent alternating series. So it's as simple as that. We're just going to use the limit as n approaches infinity to verify whether it converges or not. Now that trick, though, this particular limit is only viable when you're working with an alternating series. If it wasn't alternating, that series would not be good, or that test would not be good enough to prove whether it converges or not. Okay, I want to finish tonight's video by comparing and you know, discussing what's absolute convergence versus conditional convergence. I know we saw that on our sheet today in class, and we kind of um, were a bit puzzled by that. So, great time to discuss it. If the original series, and we'll just say the summation of a sub n, converges and the absolute value of that a sub n also converges, then we can say that the original series that we started with converges absolutely. Uh, whoa. If I could spell, that'd be great. <laughs> All right. So uh, what do I mean by that? It's a little tricky to sort that out, and I want to keep it as simple. I want you to always think of P-series, and that's anytime I get a little foggy on this topic, I just think of a P-series, and I kind of have this one particular example memorized, and I think it makes a lot of sense. Let's take a look at the series, negative 1 to the nth all over n squared. Okay, so let's call this the original series. And on his own merit, okay, this particular series converges because as an alternating series, the limit does equal 0. Now, let's take the absolute value of that term. If I take the absolute value of negative 1 to the nth all over n squared, what does that give me? That simply gives me 1 over n squared. Now, does this rascal still converge? Yes, he does. Because we have p equals 2 and that's greater than 1. And because this rascal converged, we could go back here and say the original series not only converges, but it converges absolutely. And that's kind of extra special. All right, on this one, we're going to kind of flip the scenario around, and we'll say, hey, what if the original series still converges, but 
what if I take the absolute value of a sub n and now it diverges? Okay, so we got one of each. Then we'll go back to the original and say that that original series converges conditionally. And I'll give you a great P series as an example to help you sort this out. I want you to consider the series negative 1 to the n. We're going to keep this really simple over radical n. Now, on its own merit, this original series converges because it's an alternating series and the limit as n approaches infinity does equal 0. However, if I took the absolute value of this particular term, it would turn out to be 1 over radical n. Now that one happens to diverge because my p-value is only 1 half, and of course that's less than or equal to 1. So if this one diverges, we're going to go back here and we're going to say, okay, this one still converges, but it converges conditionally. And that's the difference between converging absolutely versus converging conditionally. Now, I hope that makes sense. And if you just simply memorize those two particular examples, I think you'll be able to kind of regroup and, and think through these problems on an exam. All right, good luck. We'll see you tomorrow.